Um, our next presenter is Chris Wilcox, who will be talking about shipping your first Python package. Please make him feel welcome. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, I've been coming to PyCon for five years and this is the first time I've gotten to speak, so I'm, I'm pretty excited. So again, my name is Chris. I live in Seattle, Washington. I work for this small internet startup you might have heard of uh, called Google. Uh, we make a search engine and some other things. Because I live in the PNW, I try to take advantage of some of the nature we have in my personal life. So that's uh, me hiking up Mount Rainier. I also have a like for all things two wheels. I don't know how that happened, but I bicycle a lot. And one of the things I do in my spare time is I'm an amateur road racer. But you probably didn't come here to hear what I do. You're probably interested about PyPI. So this is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to start by creating a simple PyPI package that we can publish. Then we're going to talk about some of the more extended features you likely want to use in setup.py. And then we'll talk a bit about how you can use automation to make maintaining this process a lot easier. So what is PyPI? What PyPI is is a package repository for Python maintainers. It's one of the things that makes Python a joy to use. It's the ecosystem that we all came to Python for. And it's because of this ecosystem that Python developers can learn and build great and interesting things. But over time, Python has evolved. And along with Python, PyPI has evolved. And with these evolutions, changes came. And this has made PyPI seem mysterious to many people. My hope here today is to prove that there is no mystery. It's simple. And everyone in this room should be able to deploy a package to PyPI. And with any luck, by the end of this talk, every one of you will be a Python package author. So what is a Python package? A Python package is a module, a class, some functions that you have that you can deploy for other users. And here is a really simple one. We have a module called My Package. It has an init, and it has a module. That module has a very simple function called spam that always returns eggs. And this is enough for us to demonstrate how you might deploy to PyPI. So the first thing we need to do is make a setup.py file. There are only four fields required in order to deploy to PyPI. You need a name for what this package is. You need a version, a brief description, and you need to know what things you need in the package. The line at the bottom, setuptools.findpackages, is a helper function provided by setuptools that will discover the necessary things inside that folder for you. And the first thing we do, because we're good software engineers, is we test first before doing anything else. So we can make a virtual environment. We can install using pip. So this is a little more uh, unusual than the way you might use pip now. We use dot, which specifies to install this directory, where setup to pi is, and dash e, which is editable or development mode. The reason we do this is when we make changes to our package, we don't have to keep reinstalling it. After we've done that, we can open a Python REPL, import our package, and prove it works. Yay. The next thing we do is we can upload this to test PyPI. It probably wouldn't be a great idea to do this right to PyPI, since it's likely being your first time doing this, you're going to have some stumbling blocks. So we start by installing some dependencies. We need twine and we need wheel. Then we run Python, set up to py, sdist, bdist wheel. And what does that mean? sdist is a source distribution, meaning we're just going to bundle up the Python scripts that we have so that way they can be uh, shipped to PyPI and downloaded by our users. bdist wheel is a binary distribution in the wheel format. This is the uh, sort of accepted and expected way of shipping binary distributions. For pure Python packages, this isn't strictly necessary, but it is seen as good practice to provide wheels for your packages. And it's easy to do, so we'll do it here. Once we've done that, we can use twine to upload. And because we're not doing this to the default endpoint, PyPI, we specify test PyPI as the repository. The argument after that is a glob pattern that will collect everything under dist. Dist is the folder where everything built by the setup.py process on the line previous will be put. And at the end, we can install from test PyPI using pip in the way you expect, but we have to specify the index URL because, again, it's not the default. And doing this to PyPI, very much the same process. 
It's a little simpler here because we don't need to uh, reinstall all of our dependencies. But again, we build from setup, and we upload with Twine. And here we are. We have a package now that we can install and we can use. So that's it. Uh, the talk is over. You can now deploy to PyPI. Uh, congratulations, everyone. You, you are now package authors. <laughs> Except you might have noticed this is, this is pretty bare minimum. And if you saw this coming to PyPI, you might think this is a bit sketchy. It is the bare minimum. <laughs> Uh, you, you can do the bare minimum if you'd like. Uh, that's OK. That's up to you. Uh, but I, I think here we like to do more than the bare minimum for our users. Uh, what, what do you think? Yes. All right. More flair. More flair, yeah. <laughs> so the first thing we want to talk about is adding author information. If you ran setup.py estes today on your computer, you'd get a few warnings. And the warnings tell you that it's expected that you have an URL, an author, and an author email. And these, these are pretty good expectations, right? We're putting something on the internet. People should know how to get in touch with us. So giving a repository URL and what our name is is going to build some trust. And so we can add these things here. There's another really important thing in PyPI for discovering packages we're interested in and understanding what these packages are. And those are classifiers. PyPI today provides over 600 different classifiers for you to use that help you describe packages. On the screen now, are some of the more common things you might see. First, we talk about the development state. Where are we in the process of this package? Is it alpha? Has it matured? Do we consider production? The next thing you'll usually see are some specifiers around programming languages. This package, I just made it today. So I'm going to support the current Python 3 versions that haven't been end of life. So that's 3.5, 3.6, and 3.7. Because this package has nothing specific to an operating system, we can say it works on all of them. There's no reason I would believe that printing eggs would have a problem on any OS today. <laughs> the, the last thing we can do is we can talk about topics. And so here I've said this is a utility. There are a lot of these. Uh, scientific computing is one, for instance, uh, one of them for internet. And so you can really begin to describe your package to users. This is probably the most important thing, though, that was missing previously. There was no license. Licenses aren't required to upload to PyPI, but I would strongly recommend them. It's the case for a lot of users in the Python community uh, that they can't use your package without a license. Uh, and not, not to turn this into a licensing talk, but if you have no license, that's not the equivalent of a free-for-all. Uh, some people might think that if you just don't give a license, I can do whatever I want. That's not true. For a lot of us in, in sort of the corporate world, uh, we need a license to understand what rights we're being given and what rights we're giving. And without that, we're dead in the water. So there are a bunch of classifiers. There's around 80 of these. And I called out three of the most common licenses uh, from my perspective using Python packages. You'll see a lot of MIT, Apache, and GPL. Uh, MIT and Apache are both fairly unrestricted licenses. They do have differences. You should read about them on your own before choosing one. But those are probably the most common. Uh, with GPL coming in next. The other thing that was missing is any sort of meaningful description or getting started, installation information. And we can provide that via longer description. The code on this slide shows you how we could read in the readme from our repository and then put it into the long description. So long description takes text. Long description content type allows us to tell it what that text is. And that's pretty important, because without the content type, it just assumes it's plain text, which probably isn't what you intended to get. There are a lot of supported formats. Plain text is one of them, along with common mark, restructured text. And the most recent one is GitHub Markdown, which I find very convenient, since it's kind of the default for that world. So after all that, this is what our setup to Pi looks like. It's not anything too crazy, but what this results in is a more reasonable looking PyPI package. It goes a bit beyond the minimum we need, but it's enough that our users can understand what our package is about, where it can be used, et cetera. But I want to talk about some other things. These things are general improvements beyond the things that you tend to look at first on PyPI, but they're going to make maintaining your package easier, and they're going to better communicate things to your users. So I want to start by talking about a thing called Python requires. 
PyPI right now doesn't enforce Python versions for your installs. So let's say I went today and I shipped this package without Python requires, and a Python 3.4 user came along, or a Python 2.7 user came along and tried to install the package. And it doesn't work, and they have a problem. Now, we might expect that the user would go back to the, pack, the package page and notice that, oh, it says the supported version is you know, 3.5 plus. But there's pretty much an li equally likely chance that that same user files a bug about how it doesn't work, doesn't tell you they're on 2.7, you spend the next three hours of your life trying to figure out why this is doing some weird thing, to eventually realize three days later that the problem is they're using an unsupported version that you'd never tested. And that's not a good situation for anyone. It's not good for your customer, because they've wasted time trying to use something that was never going to work. You spend time trying to debug. And so at the end of the day, the best thing we can do for everyone is be transparent and honest about what it is we do and don't support. And Python requires allows us to do that. So because, again, I shipped this today, I'm going to support 3.5, 3.6, and 3.7, and this takes care of that. Another thing that isn't happening in this small package, but is far more common in real-world packages, are dependencies. So imagine for a moment that you had a package that needed to get content from the internet. If you're going to do that, you're likely using Erlib 3, using requests. These are pretty common packages for, for doing this sort of thing. And so here's an example of how you might do that. Install requires takes an array. We give it the packages. And this way, PyPI, when it installs the setup.py, can go ahead and install your dependencies for the user so they don't end up in a weird place where, where things don't work. The last thing I wanted to talk about adding to setup.py is the reduction, the exclusion of certain things from our package. This turns out to be a little more controversial because some users really do want everything. They want your tests, they want your docs, they want it all to come down right away. Uh, this is really common in audit workflows. So if someone wants to be able to run your test once they've installed to verify it works, they want the unit tests. The problem is, these things can also be seen as bloat for pretty much every other user. And for a lot of packages uh, that I've worked on, tests make up a significant portion of the code base. Docs take up a lot of space. And so I don't really want to have to distribute those every time and increase the size of my install, which might be problematic for people with slow internet or on platforms that have limited disk space. And so you can limit some of these things. You can exclude them so that they don't come down. Another thing that we sort of glossed over is I talked about publishing without ever once talking about having credentials. PyPI works on a username password model. And there's talk to add, add new sorts of authentication for them, but this is the state of the art today. And there are a few ways to manage this. The most obvious one is when you run from the CLI, Twine, it'll prompt for a username, it'll prompt for a password. And this is really easy to get started with. You store your password and username combination in your, your password manager. And when you need to publish, you just fetch it, and then you type it in. Another common way is a file called .pyprc. This file tends to live in your home directory. And we can form it as you see here. So the repository URL would be for pyp, pypi. Username would be, my, in my case, CR Wilcox, And then I'd have a password. There's one other way that is becoming more popular among people, and they, they seem to like this, uh, Keyring. So we can install Keyring. Keyring is a password manager that when given a endpoint, so in our case, a URL to test PyPI or to PyPI, and a username, it will provide the password. I think it's important to mention, by default, this isn't all that secure. Um, it might seem on the surface like this is, this is better. Um, it does allow you to look the things up by your application. But in this case, the application is Python. Uh, so it, it, it's actually open to a lot of the world. Um, I think it's a little better than PyPIRC. The reason for that is it's pretty easy to accidentally commit your PyPIRC. And it's also in plain text in a predictable location on a computer that you likely use for things other than publishing packages. And so if you were to have any sort of infection or anything, uh, you'd really have to worry that your PyPI credentials have been in some ways compromised. So this is, this is what I figured at this point I would be feeling in the audience. So I've, I've shown you a bunch of different settings that you can do. But in what way am I supposed to retain a dozen different things that go in the setup.py file? Uh, my suggestion would be to not try to do that. Um, you're going to have a hard time. So what you could remember instead is that the PyPA publishes a sample project. 
And the sample project has a ton of comments on every one of these settings that helps you understand better how you might use it and why you might use it. And they have extensive documentation beyond this sample that you can use. The other thing you might find is that as you develop packages beyond your first and second one, is that you start to rely on your own work. So you've now done this a few times. You just go grab your old setup.py and you copy it into your new package. You change some things, the name of the package and whatnot, but likely things like your, your URLs are going to be mostly the same, your email is going to be the same. And so you can sort of just borrow from your past self. Another way to do this I wanted to mention is a thing called Cookie Cutter. Cookie Cutter is a really powerful templating tool that you can install via PyPI that will help lay out your entire repository. And this goes far beyond just the setup.py file. Uh, we're talking about your git ignore files, documentation layouts, uh, testing infrastructure, um, at least the start of it. It can be very helpful. On the other hand, it also can come off as kind of opinionated because it has already made all of these decisions for you. And so if you can agree with it, very helpful. If you disagree with it, that, that might stop you in the water. The good news, it is extensible. So if you wanted to make your own template, you could. Um, that would fit the way you wanted to do things. Uh, the one I, of these I tend to choose is the bit about copying your previous work. I tend to start my packages by taking one I have and deleting a bunch of the content and then starting from there. But you can choose your own way. Um, I think my way is probably a bit messy, but it works for me. So now that we've done that, I would like to talk about how we can never do most of it again. Uh, and that's, that's my goal. Uh, I, as part of my day job, support around four dozen PyPI packages. And so trying to manually publish them would get to be a bit of a drag. So we can talk about ways we can automate this to make this a little less bad. So why, why might we automate? The first one I thought of had to do with the credentials I talked about. Managing those credentials is a risk. It also doesn't work well past one person, which is likely the case for most projects after a little bit of time. The other thing that it brings is consistency. Computers are very good at following instructions. Human beings, less so. I think most of us in grade school or sometime about then took uh, an instructions test where you walked through it and you get to the end and they're like, you didn't need to do this at all, sit quietly. Uh, at least they did that to me, it was torture. And they did that and uh, you messed it up. But computers will follow every step you give them exactly every time. So automation is repeatable. The other thing is it gives you scale. When you're one person, having a bespoke development environment is perfectly fine. The second you have two people, that, that doesn't work anymore. And so if we have automation to do this, we simplify our dev environment, we make it easier to onboard, and we allow ourselves to grow our team. So the first thing I'd like to talk about automating is some of our test work. One of the interesting things about Python packages over, say, a web service, is you have to support multiple platforms. If you're just running, a, 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 let's say, a Flask app, you probably only care about a single version of Python at a time. With packages, you almost always care about all of the currently supported versions of Python, which tends to be three, four, five things at once that you have to worry about. And so using testing tools that help us to parameterize this, to support four to five test runs at once that are all the same, uh, other than the Python version, is very helpful. So there are two I want to mention. I couldn't talk about text, test automation without talking about Tox, because it's by far the most popular test automation tool in Python. It's based on INI files, where you can specify the Python versions you need to test, what a test scenario might look like. But there's another one I want to talk about that I find myself using. It's called Knox. Knox is very much inspired by Tox, but it, it claims to be far more flexible, and it's based in Python. So rather than having an INI file, we end up with Python functions that we can run to execute tests. Because Tox has such a big presence already, and there's a lot of documentation in the community, I'm going to show you how Knox works, since it has a, a much smaller corpus. But definitely look into both tools. So here is a basic Knox file that will run our unit tests. Above the function declaration, there's a session decorator that takes in an array of Python versions. What this will do is when we run Knox, it will run this function three times, once for each version of Python. And what do we do inside the function? We install some test dependencies. So we install mock and we install pytest. We install our package, and then we run pytest with some arguments. 
The bit at the end, the session.passargs, that is a way to extend unit. So we're not really using that here, uh, and I don't have this on the screen, but we can pass additional parameters to unit at runtime if we want via this. And so this can be useful if you have additional test flags that you want to use, uh, or if there, there are a lot of other tasks you might do from, from let's say, docs running, and where you might want to pass more run arguments. This is one of the other cool things I like about things like Nox and Tox over just using PyTest directly, is we can make a docs target that runs every time we run our tests. All this does is install Sphinx, installs your module, builds the docs. It's, it's not too complicated. But it brings with it this really great side effect. Without this, most people find themselves building their docs when they go to release. And I, I don't know about you, but I like to find my problems much closer to when they happen than, let's say, a month later, and then wonder why I'm having an issue. When you change your code, because the docs are generated, you can break the docs, and, and Sphinx will have an issue. But if you run it as part of your test, you will know the moment you made that change, you'll know why it broke, and you'll be able to address it right then. And so by bringing our docs into our test run, we can end up with a much more stable documentation situation. This very much uh, doesn't go as deep as Knox and Tox go. Uh, luckily, there was a talk on Friday by my coworker, Thea, uh, on these tools. And the slides will be up on the PyCon 2019 YouTube channel later. The next thing we're going to talk about is moving this to CI. It's all great to automate this locally. That's a lot better. We don't have to worry about managing all that and making sure everyone's running PyTest multiple times. Let's find a way to get that into the cloud somewhere where it runs on pull requests and merges to master. There are a lot of different CI services that we can use. Uh, there are a lot of popular ones people know. Circle is the one I'm going to talk about, uh, but there's also Travis, there's AppVair, there's many more. So what is CI? CI is continuous integration. So every time we merge to master, every time we make a pull request, we can get a run. And the nice thing about this is, again, it simplifies what we require of our developers. They no longer need to have as much figured out on their machine in order to contribute to a project. We can also use CI for another task. We can use it to publish our package. So to use something like Circle, you need a GitHub or a Bitbucket account, and you can sign in with it and it knows how to discover your repositories. So the page I have up now is what you'll see once you log in. You can go to Add Projects. It'll have already discovered your repositories, and in my case, I pointed at my PyPI package. It instructs us, instructs us to create a, a folder called CircleCI and put a config.yaml in it. Config.yaml specifies two distinct things, workflows and jobs. So a workflow is a step of jobs, it's a list, and a job defines a discrete task that needs to be done as part of continuous integration. The sample YAML at the bottom is pretty good for Python programs, but it's not really tailored to PyPI. You can try to start from this, uh, but I'm going to put up the link to my GitHub at the end for this project, and you can start from that one. It's a little easier. Uh, there are some things unique to making Python packages from, say, a web app. So let's start by looking at what is in a Circle CI configuration file. First, let's talk about the workflows. Workflows are a list of jobs, and that's the same here. We have three test groups. We have a 3.5, a 3.6, and a 3.7, and we have a deploy task. And that deploy task is what we're going to use to publish our content to PyPI. There are a few extra things there. If you look under 3.7, you'll see it has a filter, and that filter says on tags, only run this on all tags. The reason I'm doing this is this way on a tag run, which is how we're going to publish, we'll run our 3.7 tests. So before we try to publish, we'll make sure at least one of our test runs work. Under deploy, again, we have filters. We have the tags filter, which has a regex, which can roughly be described as it looks like a version number. And it also ignores branches. And this is important so that way we don't try to build on master. Because the last thing I would want is merging some uh, pull request and then having it decide now is a good time to try to publish. This way we have full control over when we publish. And let's look at the test job a little bit. The test job looks very much like we would have done manually. If we ignore, ignore some of the extra stuff, check out which clones the repository and some of the virtual env creation, we install Knox and we run Knox. Deployment is very much the same story. We check out the repository, we make a virtual environment, 
we install our dependencies, Twine and Wheel, and we run the two steps we did earlier when we manually uploaded to PyPI. There are some extra steps that we need to think about with upgrading that we didn't really talk about before. We need to change the version number. The good thing is if you forget to do this, nothing really exciting happens, uh, because PyPI won't let you overwrite version numbers, but you might be surprised that you never get a new package. We started at 0.0.1, so I'm going to increment this to 0.0.2. And once you've merged this to your master branch, you're going to create a tag. You can create a tag using git tag or any of the CLI tools you use for git, but I prefer to use the releases system on GitHub. So releases will give you a archive of your current state of your repository, and they will also give you a tag. So in this case, we're going to make a tag called 0.0.2. I'm going to name the release 0.0.2. And if I'd like, I could provide a description of this release, additional changelog information. And as I said, it's going to automatically create an archive at this point that is downloadable from GitHub. And this might be useful if users don't want to use PyPI or are trying to bundle things to go somewhere else. It's, it's just convenient. And it doesn't take a lot extra for us. And once I click that, Circle is going to notice the tag. It's going to kick off a build called 0.0.2. It's going to run test 3.7. And upon a successful run, deploy is then going to run and publish to PyPI. And that's it. With that, you can publish to PyPI, you can automate the CI, you can automate your test runs. And with any luck, a few of you, hopefully all of you, are now package authors in Python. And I sincerely look forward to whatever you can bring to our ecosystem. Thank you, Chris. Um, if there are any questions, we have a couple of microphones in the aisles, so please queue up. And uh, please ask questions in the form of a question. Uh, comments can be saved for the hallway after. Thank you. Would you structure your setup.py differently for applications versus libraries? I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't question uh, Would you st structure your setup.py, would you do anything different for libraries versus uh, your application? Like, uh, it's, it's a command line application versus it's a library. Um, I mean, if I was making a, a CLI-based thing for pip, like something that uses click, not, not particularly. Uh, there are some considerations when you start to do things beyond just packages. Um, there, is, there are additional tools that exist to make sure everything is included. So it's not so much that I would structure it differently, but I might consider more, more exactly specifying the content I need. So there are, there are multiple ways to do this in Python. You can um, include package data. You can also use a thing called a manifest.in file to help make sure you get all the content. Uh, but as far as the setup to Py goes, no, it's, it's mostly the same. And you mentioned uh, you have a bunch of uh, packages that you maintain. How do you release them when there are interdependencies uh, across packages? So there's a long answer, uh, but the short answer is very carefully. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you, you do your best to not have the situations. Um, Really, you just have to stage releases, and sometimes it means releasing things twice, if I'm completely honest. Um, sometimes it does mean that package A has to go out so package B can go out, and then package A has something else again. Um, that, is, that is a talk. Um. <laughs> how, how did you handle credentials in CircleCI for the upload? Yeah, so in CircleCI, uh, I elided that because it made the slide entirely too long. Uh, the easiest way to do it is CircleCI has uh, the ability to have environment variables. Uh, and so as an environment variable, you can put your password, and then you can echo into a PyPIRC at runtime inside the virtual environment. Uh, that's the most common way to do that. Uh, it works pretty well, but it's, uh, it, it would have taken up about half of the slide to show that, and it's not really interesting um, to look at. Um, my, my hope moving forward, one of the, one of the features, um, kind of to plug here, anyone coming for sprints, one of the topics is adding API keys to PyPI and, and the system. So if you're interested in that, please stop by. Uh, it's something we'd like to get. To, for me, I would feel a lot more comfortable doing that than giving my username and password to my full account. But yeah, good question. So how do you deal with, uh, how do you deal with having multiple test runs in, say, CircleCI or Jenkins when you have Knox, which runs all of the different versions at once? Yeah, so the way it was dealt with here is that we had three different Docker containers, one of which would be 
three five, one of which would be three six, one of which would be three seven, and Knox would run in all of them. And if Knox doesn't detect a Python environment, it just skips the run. It doesn't fail. It just assumes it shouldn't have bothered running. Uh, the way I handle this in my day job is we manage a custom image that has all of the versions of Python, so we run it once, and then Knox runs all of them. There isn't really a strong reason to do uh, one or the other, uh, besides the fact that you end up having to maintain Docker containers if you do it the way we do for, for my projects. Um, we did it the way we did it for mine, is it, it does result in a speed up in test runs, and we run a lot of tests. So it was, it was just an optimization. Uh, yeah, with uh, setup tools, there's you have the ability to use a setup.config to set all those in like a plain text file. Is there any drawbacks to doing it that way, or benefits that you know of? Um, not not particularly. Uh, for a beginning project, I don't think it's strictly necessary, uh, and it, it depends a little bit too on if you're working on a binary distribution. So everything I talked about here was about a pure Python world in which we're just writing Python code. But it's not, it's not as common, but it's not uncommon to have a C extension in which the binary distributions, uh, they, get, they get a bit hairier. Um, so the setup to config, a very common thing to add is uh, to, to specify what kind of BDIST we're going to do and to specify things like we want a universal wheel. Uh, that's, that's pretty common. Um, like I said, you can also use manifest.in. Some of this is, is personal style. Um, I find myself using those more when the setup to pi gets kind of long. So if, if things start to feel unwieldy, I'll, I'll kind of tuck them away to the side. But for a lot of packages, it's, it's just not strictly necessary. A lot of them are, are rather simple and well-contained. You, know, you have a few methods on the public surface. So. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Thank you again, Chris. Yeah.